Are you ahead of Dan where he was in 10 months? I think you probably would be. In, in turnover-wise, I'm not sure, but here on out, yeah. I'm punching half a million for the year. So today we're joined by Adam, and you've just been going for less than a year, and I hear you're a bit of a star, so your franchise or Dan told me how much revenue you're generating in your business, and it's quite amazing within 12 months that you've already got multiple employees, you're earning a substantial amount of money every week, which is absolutely fantastic and a credit to yourself. So let's just start off with first, Adam, about what were you doing prior to Jim's mowing, and, and how have you found the experience so far? Uh, so before I started with Jim's mowing, I was actually a teacher, and I taught for about three and a half years. I was doing casual stuff on the Gold Coast and then I moved up way up north in the Gulf of Carpentaria. I was teaching there for about two and a half years. Started climbing the ladder, so to speak. Got into leadership for the school and I was in leadership for about a year and a half. You know, just with the school holidays and everything, like you get paid, you have lots of breaks. It was great, but just the money wasn't there for me. I was trying to save for a house and, and flying in and out of the island, even with all the government perks and benefits of the job, just wasn't I think was just getting hit harder on tax than I had expected. So gyms, I had looked into gyms probably right before I started teaching. I just thought, oh, yeah, I could probably do it as a side gig while I was studying. And then, you know, the emails just came every six months or whatever. And so then I, I finally saw an ad and thought, yeah, right, like I'll give it a crack because the guaranteed weekly income was basically the same as what I was making as a professional teacher. And so I thought, you know, the flexibility of the hours, the things that you would hear from from a lot of the ads and the guys say that you could work minimal hours and earn the same income as I was earning as a teacher. More time with family, you can, you know, got time to do school drop off and all the rest of it. I thought, yeah, right, sounds good. Like I've got 13 weeks of holidays. I'll jump in, see how it goes. Yeah, so that's pretty much what got me into it. And within my first month, I made back what I had invested. So I was like, all right, it's a winner here and you know, I can do something with it. So stuck around. That's an amazing effort in your first month. How did you get to that level so quickly? Because sometimes people might take a bit longer to build, whereas with you, you've just, as you said, you, your ROI is pretty much you paid off. You, you've generated that money back from in the first month, which is quite amazing. So is there anything you think you maybe did differently or how did you do that so quickly? As I was investigating, the most common thing I heard was talk to people, talk to people, talk to people. You know, I saw Dan's heroic Jim's mowing career and I thought, all right, like I want to match. It's heroic. That. That's a good, he, he love that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to match what he's done or, or like I'm very competitive. So I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to beat him. That was my goal starting out. So I talked to Dan and I said, you know, how do I do this? And Dan said, look, mate, talk to this guy, this guy and this guy, they're franchisees, they're killing it. So I called them, had a chat with them, see what they did. And then basically just did the exact same thing as what they were doing. And that's why my first month was just monstrous. And then as time went on, I was like, you know, I want, I want to get off the tools and get other guys on and pay them like a better rate than what they would get at any other job. Yeah, so I called, again, called people, called Dan, my franchise, or had a chat with them, heard what they did, and then did the same thing. And what were they doing? What were they doing, Adam, that you implemented? What were some things? So I come from, like, before I was teaching – my father's a builder, so I was working offside a lot of tradesmen, had a lot of landscaping experience. My father would build a house and me and my two brothers would do all the landscaping, so I had heaps of experience in, in gardening. I took on a lot of landscaping jobs to start out, and that's like was big money for the first month. But as time went on, I was like, you know, Dan, Dan made a killing doing mowing, so like, how is he doing that? I talked to him about it and he was like, you know, you've got to be right on your pricing. You've got to be right on your overheads. Like you, you just got to make sure everything kind of lines up with what you want. And then, you know, the more I, the more I listened, I remember Jim's at, at the Jim's training, uh, Jim's voice comes to mind. He says, we are the elite. We don't want the people that are cheap as chips. And, and around that time I was doing cheap as chips moment. Cause I was just, you know, I need, I need that source of income. I need the, mm need the income coming into the cash flow and the cheap guys usually pay on time. Just the more I talk to people, the more I learn that, you know, there are ways to get money before you do a job so you can have the cash flow coming in as, as opposed to doing the work and then hoping you get paid within a, a decent amount of time. So moved away from landscaping and just started ramping up the mowing and, and taking leads that were just mowing. And the more I did that, the leads kind of stayed the same. I got the same amount of leads, but they were all targeted at mowing as opposed to across the board. And so that's how I started building up my runs and, and getting a lot of regular clients. And to be honest, it was, I didn't expect the growth because 
whether I was charging my minimum price or, or my premium price, people were accepting at the same rate. So I, again, went back to my franchisor and said, what the hell's going on here? Like, doesn't matter what I say, they, they accept it and, and they stay on board as well for, for regular jobs. And obviously that comes down to a lot of customer service, you know, good communication, punctuality, that they love it. I think communication is key because in, in this in this industry, you get a lot of guys that start up their own business and they're, they're working for wages, really. They'll do a mo for like 50 bucks and it might take them an hour, an hour and a half. And like, I've got two guys in a trailer that will knock over a job in 30 minutes. And so cuts down on the noise time for the customer, just makes them have a better experience. And yeah, I guess people prefer that. And we show up, we're on time. We have a system where, you know, we've got the customer satisfaction guarantee. We'll come back and fix it. No charge to you guys. We come back ASAP. Basically, just giving them a good experience is what helps build it, as well as just targeting targeting the leads that you want. And when did you put on your first employee? How how soon into the business? So three months in, I I took two months off. I got my younger brother to come and basically do everything. I changed the number on the gym's lead transfer to go to him. So he would get at the leads. He would contact the customers. He would go out and quote. He'd go out and do it. He did it all. I just sent the invoices. That was it over that two-month period. And then I came back and he was like, dude, like I want to get into fitness. This isn't really my industry that I want to work in. I was like, all right. So I took it back for three months and got my my first basically – he was casual at the time, but he's pretty much full-time. He's doing – he was doing above 40 hours with me because I had a, a lot of work because it was hitting summer. So it was around November, so three months in. Two months off, what's that, five months? And then three months later, about about at the eight-month mark, I had a guy that was working with me. And then two weeks after that, got another guy and I was off the tools. So I basically worked about five months with gyms before I was like work from phone as opposed to working on the tools and, and going outside. So you're full cool off the tools now? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just sales now. I just do, wow. I just do loading and, and um, even if there's a, a job that needs fixing up or something was missed, I, I go out, have a look, say, yep, it was missed, uh, and then get the guys to go out and do it. So I haven't picked up a whip snip or pushed a mower for, yeah, probably about three months now. A lot of guys who will be listening to this, maybe current franchisees, wanting to probably do what you have done, maybe probably five or six years even into the business. So how did you relinquish control of the actual, of doing what you've done? Because a lot of, I think a lot of people want to do what you're doing, but they struggle to do it. Whereas you've done it so quick within less than a year, which I think yeah, is what yeah. the goal for a lot of people is. So how did yeah. you, how did you do it? Finding the right guy because, you know, the biggest real control and you give it to someone else, the quality of service goes down a lot. So finding the right guy, he's got the right attitude, he shows up, he's consistent and he's with me every day. And every day I just use what we used at school with positive reinforcement as opposed to negative. Like, oh, you didn't do that, you missed that. So, no, you did a good job here. This is what I want you to work on next time. Instead of saying what you've done wrong, you tell him what he's done right and what he can do better. And that really gives them motivation, I guess, as, as, a, as well as giving them the vision for the company. So I said, right now, it's just you and me, mate. But if you do a good enough job, I want you to be me. So you learn the sales and you start getting off the tools like I have. And you just go out and do quality control for the other guys. You do the sales, but I pay you higher. And so show him the ladder he's able to climb the ladder it's not a dead-end job for him and if he wanted to buy part of the business once we grow bigger he can do it take his own and go so giving them the vision i guess was was super important as foundation but training them like if you really want it to work you need to make that guy that you're hiring or, or woman they need to be you and so he needs to do the same thing he needs to think the same thing he needs to talk to the customer the same way i do and so it was just training i trained him he was with me for about a month, you know, every single day, just training, 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 getting him to reflect on his day as well. Like, what did he do? What does he think he's good at? What does he think he can do better? And you see how nothing is, is a negative connotation there. Everything's positive, building, building, building. And that's really what gets them to where they are, where, where I can have full trust in them, that they're going to come to work. They're going to do a great job. I don't need to be sitting there with anxiety going, oh, my goodness, I'm going to lose a customer because I'm not sure if he's going to get there. I'm not sure if he's going to do everything he needs to do. It's just, yeah, they're, they're 100% in control. They are me. They're just 
clones of me doing the same thing I would do. It's a great point. So you've obviously and a lot of so you've invested a lot of time into the training, which is fantastic. Whereas sometimes people might not do. They might be a couple of days and then away they go. But you sound like you've invested a lot of time, Adam, into these these person and and your star rating is really good. I've had a look on the system here. So you maintain quality control whilst being in the office, which I think's the, the most biggest challenge for people is when they have employees to to manage that sort of quality control. So it's obviously working. Now, where did you find these people? Where do you find your employees? Is there any sites or how do you find them? Yeah. So. I guess that's the hardest thing. I post on Facebook, on the Facebook groups. Every every suburb will have its own little group yep. and some are more active than others. So I jump on the active ones and I post, you know, this is what I pay, come work for Jim's Mowing. Uh, we have this many hours a week minimum for you. And then you get flooded, honestly, you get flooded. And that's free advertising. You know, you could jump on Seek, but I meet a lot of Jim's guys at the tip and they say they, you know, you pay like 350 bucks. Yeah, it's a lot of money. And, and you get flooded, but... It's just resumes. Like you have no person-to-person conversation and it's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. And I thought, you know, and then you get a guy and he's just, you know, he doesn't work out. So I thought, oh, I don't want to spend too much time and money on something that's not very efficient. So I thought, all right, I'll go on Facebook because then I can check on their Facebook profile. You know, I can kind of suss them out and kind of judge the book by its cover before I get them on. And then I send them a list of questions. Some people respond, some people don't respond. I think it's a lot better than a resume. Um, wait, wait, so when you say this is great advice for our franchisees, I want to put this in the next newsletter. Actually, the um, yeah. so so you go in the Facebook groups and you post. I'm looking for. Do you what's your job post? Is I look, I'm looking for full time or looking for a casual gardener? Or what's the actual description you're putting in the group post? So it just says I'm hiring yeah. Jim's mowing and the rate. That's it. And then if they're interested. They'll contact me. Some people say they want more money. Some people say, uh, how many hours is it? And then as soon as I get a response from them, I send them eight questions to respond to and it, it shows them when was the last time or how long have you been without work? How many hours are you willing to do? What days can, what's your availability? And then I give them some customer service questions as well. What would you do in this, this case, this case, this case? And these are common problems that will arise during the job. Some people will respond and answer all the questions. Great. Uh, some people won't, but you got to be careful as well because if if a guy tells you everything you want to hear, you got to remember if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Some people will say everything that you want to hear, and then when you say, "All right, mate, come to work at this day, this hour," they just don't show up, and then you're left without a worker, and you've got to kind of problem solve that. So if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. That's been my experience with the last fifty guys that I've talked with. Yeah. And, and with those questions, Adam, are you saying like a um, Google form or is it just literally over Messenger or how do you get the questions to them? Is it a Word doc or what do you do? Yeah, no, it's just a copy and paste message from from Messenger from the Facebook, yeah. No, it's a great bit of advice. And um, you're right, a lot of guys spend a lot of money in Seek, but these groups are really good. We've actually got a Jim's Mowing Work for a Franchisee Facebook group as well now. So we're starting to get people because we always get asked on the main page, I'm looking yeah, for a awesome. job, looking for jobs. So we're getting to post in that group and hopefully over time that keeps building. But yeah, it's a really good why you do it because that's a big problem for um franchisees and what they do and and in regards to um how you actually run your crews um you've you got how many employees at four people now you have or yeah i've got four and then i've got one uh admin as well okay it's great so you've got guys on the tools one in the office yeah Yeah, now are they going out in twos or are they going out individually or how are you doing that yeah so when i when i started i went with three i went with two guys and then i trialed with three and it just it doesn't save you any money it doesn't make them more efficient or or anything like that so i went down to two i even tried just one some guys can do one but they they run out of energy quickly so they're more likely to take a day off or or take longer breaks or or not get through all the work for the day two is is perfect for for my business two is perfect they swap they alternate one does the snipping and the first job one does the mowing and then they swap for the next one they also swap driving as well so they share the load on absolutely everything. Everything's 50-50. Uh, I do have one team that told me they prefer, he prefers just mowing, he prefers just whip snipping. He doesn't want to touch a mower. So they work like a treat. They're, they're beautiful. They, they smash out the work and they hammer it because they love what they're doing. Uh, they don't need to share anything. They both understand each other. So also finding cohesiveness between the teams is, is super important. You got two guys on. I did have two guys on that they didn't like each other. So... They would do half days because, you know, they would have a blue and then one guy would leave the job and then the other guy finishes the work on his own, but they don't get through it. So I had to sort that out. They're both still on. They're just in different teams and 
and they love it too. They prefer it that way. How do you maintain the um? Uh, are you checking in every day at the end of the day, or how do you maintain communication with them? Or are you doing it on the phone all the time per job, or what are you doing with them? Yeah, so early on, it's it's very much daily. So in the morning, I'll be out there when they arrive to get the trailer and the gear. Uh, I'll be out there. I'll run them through three key things that they want them to focus on for the day, uh, and it may differ. Uh, be different per person but I give I give the teams three general things for the company and then if I have something for an individual I'll just go to him one-to-one -one personally so he doesn't you know share across everyone I'll just tell him personally look mate you got to work on this uh, I want you to focus on this because your goal is to get here like if, if you're not learning in my business uh, what are you doing you're in a dead-end job and I don't want you to feel like that because I hated feeling like that when I was working so I'd always try and give them that reinforcement that you know, there's a next level to this, dude. So if you work hard and, and you turn your brain on, you'll go to the next level with me because I want the business to grow past a couple million dollars. I don't want to sit down and go, yeah, yeah, I'm satisfied. Like, I'm, I'm not satisfied. It needs to keep going. And so I try to put that into them. Like I said, they need to become me. And once they get that, and they get that ambition as well. They realise, oh, yeah, it's not a dead-end job. I can earn a lot more money than even going to university and getting a degree. So I try to instill that. But, yeah, in the mornings, definitely have a chat with them. In the afternoon, when they drop off the stuff, I'll have a check-in. Like, how was it? How do you like? The main issue with them is how did you like working with your partner? Your partner is, like, they're the one holding your hand. They're the one pushing you in the back saying, keep moving. So if, if they're not doing that, you guys are going to fall off the, the wagon. So working with a partner is something I'll definitely check in with. But, yeah, I tell them, call me anytime during the day if you've got an issue give me a ring and we try to sort it out that way. I try to get them to try and figure it out themselves because that's what I would do if I was on the tools. But if, if they can't or if they have any questions, yeah, they call me any time of the day. It happens a lot depending on who you got. I used to have a guy that would call me all the time, every job he got to because he just couldn't make an executive decision on his own. But obviously he's no longer with us because I want someone that can figure things out. If you've got problem solving, it's hard to find, but you can teach it. And if you do spend time on teaching it, you'll you'll be like you have a whole day, whole week to yourself where you don't hear from your employees, everything runs smoothly, and you got the money in the bank. And how do you 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 incentivize them purely by the um by the the thing that they can go to a higher level? Or is there something or is there something else you do have like a structure bonus structure in place for jobs completed, or how are you incentivizing their yes, yeah. performance as well? Yeah, good question. I was actually missing that. So I tell them every day. Oh, I tell them at the start of the week, so I know my numbers for the week. If my numbers are above what my minimum budget is, I'll tell them, I don't care how many hours you do. If you do more, great, I'll pay you more. But if you do less, say if you only do 10, 20, 25 hours this week, I'll still pay you the 38. And so that gives them the incentive, all right, we can go home at 1, we can go home at 12, and we'll still get paid until 4. Yeah, it does work. They they smash it out too. And usually they're like even on a week where they're hitting about 36, I'll still pay them 38. Like if, if it costs me a little bit more to keep that incentive and keep that motivation going, I'll invest in it because in the long run, yeah, it's going to pay off. Now with your philosophy towards gear, what sort of gear do you give your teams and what, what sort of um, checklist or procedures do you put in place for gear maintenance? Yep, so gear maintenance is on me. I prefer that just because I've had a few guys that have, stuffed it up and cost me a lot of money trying to fix it so gear maintenance wise i do it every week so usually on the weekend i'll check the gear over blades oil changes spark plugs carby cleans all that takes me probably an hour i use the honda self-propelled for every yeah. job i know dan has advice not to do it because you know it's lighter to use other mowers and whatnot but i find that the guys they prefer using the self-propelled as opposed to pushing so I try to keep them happy and just go with the, the um, self-propelled. I also I use combi tools as opposed to, to snippers. So I use the combi snipper attachment uh, still, the still brand, and same with the blower, still blowers as well. So one whipper snipper, which is a still in the trailer, only one mower, and with the combi and attachment, hedge up, pole saw, and snipper as well. So I try to keep just two snippers because usually I find I have more issues with the whip snipper than I do with the mower. For me, the mower is easy to fix. Like you get the training, that gym's training on, on the mower, and, and that's pretty simple stuff, really. Um, How did you find so the training uh, as, a, as a teacher when you came down here? 
Yeah, it was great because I had no business experience pretty much at all. So just learning the business mentality uh, as opposed to the employee mentality was great because like as much as, yeah, they teach you on the tools, like gardening is not a, it's not a, a licensed trade. Like you don't need a license to, to work in it. So you can kind of figure it out and just improve yourself as you go. But the training in terms of the business knowledge was was amazing. I would highly recommend it to anyone because I started out with no business knowledge and now getting into it, it's like, yeah, I know, I know a lot about business and a lot of it comes from the things that Jim's mowing in the business training said. Now, I know that sounds like, you know, a plug and I'm plugging it, but, you know, I don't get paid to say that. No one's paying me to say that. I'm not getting a commission for saying that, but I 100% back it. 100%. Like even if I wasn't going into a franchise for gyms, I would still go to that training because everyone there has their own business and they tell you what worked for their business. And if you take it on board and you keep the accountability measures with your business plan and your, your 12 point plan for your day and all the things that they tell you to do, like you just, you find amazing success with it. 100%. Um- yeah. And, and what's your plan for your um your business overall? I mean, you've gone you've gone to a pretty remarkable level. Like a lot of guys might be franchisees or just looking and want to do what you've done, but they they just can't do it. But you've done it so quick, which is amazing. So, what's your plan for your own business? Are you are you like is it is it a revenue goal? Like I want to hear, as you mentioned, two million or a million dollar revenue, or is it is it something where you just want to see how much you can get to twenty staff? Or what's your sort of overall vision for you? Let's say your business over the next let's say five years. Over five years, so my initial plan for five years is to be where I am today. And so I'm like, okay, in five years, I'm going to smash that. <laughs> um, so it's made me consider what my goals were. Initially, I told Dan I want to make it multi-million, but now I'm looking at I'll, pr- I'll probably be satisfied with minimum take-home of 20 grand a week net. So if I could get 10 trailers on, get 20 blokes on, have a commercial warehouse where all the gear's stored and everything. That's that's where I'd want to be, and eventually I'd want the monopoly on it. So I I often see the ads on on um, the gym's website. Guys are selling their stuff, and I'm thinking, you're crazy, man. Why are you selling? Like the opportunity is there. You just got to figure it out and get it. And so if they're selling, I'm going to buy their stuff. I'm going to buy their clients, and I'm basically going to have all Queensland. It's just going to be me and the gyms. Uh, that's the ambition. But yeah, like it's 100% doable. Like I've got no doubt that I could do that if I wanted to. Yeah, we're going to give you this on behalf of the gyms group, so you'll get this via email, which is in a course of a membership. But I'm very impressed, Adam. It's amazing what you've done. You know, I get I interview a lot of franchisees. I probably interviewed 250 in the last year and a half, and um, you've definitely achieved in regards to business growth the most in that short amount of time. So within 10 months to do what you're doing to be off the tools is a lot of franchisees' dreams, and they don't do it for because of all these reasons, but you've managed to do it. So, and you've outlined, I think you've outlined a lot of ways you've done it, which I think is, from hearing you speak, you can tell why you've been able to do it. But um, you've got a really strong focus on training and um, caring for your guys and, and your employees. And you've got, you seem like you've got a really determined vision of where you want to be and you've got that growth mindset, which is absolutely amazing. And I hope people listen to this and just go, it's amazing. Like we didn't go too much into your figures and stuff like that, but they can work it out how well you're doing in, um, absolute credit to yourself and i'm looking forward to following in with you maybe in a year or two to see to get to that to see to see where you are because it's quite an amazing business you, you got and i think i don't know you're ahead of dan where he was in 10 months i think you probably would be in in turnover wise i'm not sure but here on yeah. out I'm, I'm punching half a million for the year so i'd say you, know, you would I'm be not, I'm not sure yeah, yeah i'd say you would be so um yeah, yeah not to well, rub it into dan <laughs> but um, he's obviously driving you to do that. So um, but no, mate, you're an absolute star in the division. Really rapid to have met you. Um, it's great for us to see how well you're doing. It's just an amazing achievement. But it's a big credit to yourself, and obviously you got Dan supporting you there too as well. So Adam, thank you very much for joining us today on the Jim's Mowing Podcast. We appreciate your time. No worries, Joel. Thanks heaps. Thanks, Adam. See you, mate. Thank you for listening to the episode of the More Than Just Mowing Podcast by Jim's Mowing. If you do need help with your local gardening expert, please give us a call at one three one five four six for Australia. 0800 454 654 for New Zealand or head to jimsmowing.com.au or jimsmowing.co.nz. If you liked what you heard, please make sure you leave us a review as well. Wherever you consume your podcast, we appreciate your support. And until next episode, we hope you have a great week.